With episode eight, Listen gets demoted to second best episode of the year. And who's new at number one? Are you my mummy? Wait. Oh, the doctor made that joke in the episode. Never mind. <laughs> Series eight, episode eight, Mummy on the Orient Express. The title and the premise come from Stephen Moffat. Very simple. Put a mummy on a space train. Moffat gave the assignment to Jamie Matheson, new to the program. Matheson is written for being human. Used to do stand-up, and he's terrific. Directed by Paul Wilmshurst, who also directed the previous week's Kill the Moon. We're in some future, or past, or possibly present, where fashion resembles the glittering wealth of the upper crust society of Earth's 1920s. I'll confess I was tempted to call this episode a winner simply on the basis of Clara's beaded dress straight out of the 20s. It's a knockout, and her bobbed hair reminiscent of the magical Louise Brooks. I could probably have just ogled Clara's dress for 45 minutes and left a happy viewer. To quote Lyle Lovett, that doesn't make you a shallow person, does it? Doctor also changed his wardrobe for the occasion. Usually tieless, he stepped out of the TARDIS in a wide lapel tuxedo, sporting a large black cravat. A bit reminiscent of the neckwear of the first Doctor, William Hartnell. But nice work, Howard Burton, who's been doing costume on the show since 2012. There's more to this episode than just a pretty dress and a big black cravat. A lot more. There's a pretty train, too. A spacefaring version of the famed Orient Express. Excellent visualization from the CG team. And there's a fine and varied stock company of crew members and passengers, all well cast and crisply written. Plus, there's a very menacing monster of the week, as promised in the title. Who doesn't like a shuffling mummy and rotting bandages? Now, usually mummy movies make me ask, well, why don't the people just run away from it? These things can't move very fast. I think Matheson asked the same question, because the mummy he concocted, known as the Foretold, can teleport. So running ain't gonna help. Neither will locking yourself away in the next car. The foretold is not only impossible to escape, impossible to stop, he's also impossible to see unless he's coming to kill you. Brilliant twist. The monster is only visible to one person at a time, his next victim. No one else can even see him. And the victim gets precisely 66 seconds before croaking. Just to be sure you're following that, the production even puts a countdown clock on the screen. Like a game show. Hokey, but fun. But above all that, what kicks this episode in the first place is story and character. It's always story and character. Before I sink into the details, let me pull way back and talk structure. Then I'll zoom in. And warning, there will be spoilers. Sometimes, rarely, there's a brilliant episode of Doctor Who that's entirely self-contained. I'm thinking Blink, Midnight, some of the Christmas specials. But what's really working well for me this season is the way each episode advances multiple stories across multiple time frames. These story arcs work almost like the gear wheels inside a watch, wheels within wheels, each one turning in its own rhythm. Almost like the opening image of the title sequence, the new title sequence. The fastest wheel, the mystery of the week, or the threat of the week, usually resolved in a single episode. Then there's a slower wheel, the overall arc of the series for the year. This arc is all pointing towards episode 12, Death in Heaven, just four episodes away. I hear the Cybermen are in that one. Running alongside of that, sometimes slower, usually slower, is the story of the Doctor's relationship with his current companion. Sometimes those stories end in heartbreak. Rose Tyler banished to an alternate universe. Donna Noble having her memory wiped so she could survive her heroic moment as the Dr. Donna. And finally, the slowest of all the story arcs, the 2,000-year saga of the Doctor himself, Time Lord from Gallifrey, the madman with the box, the man who combines compassion and clinical ruthlessness, dry intellect, mischievous humor, sorrow, joy, courage, ferocity, all in an ever-changing recipe. He fascinates us because of that complexity. We sort of know what to expect, but we can never quite be sure. Now, if you saw the previous week's episode, Kill the Moon, You'll recall that the Doctor had saddled Clara and two other humans with the momentous decision of whether or not to blow up the moon. And he stepped aside. He left them alone and let them make their choice. Clara was livid that the Doctor had put her in that spot, and in a fiery, accusatory speech, she told him to get lost. Just stormed out of the TARDIS in a high dudgeon, whatever that is. Side question. Why are dudgeons always high? Why is it always a high dudgeon? Is nobody ever in a low dudgeon or just a dudgeon? Apparently, dudgeon isn't that strong a word. It doesn't have enough oomph to work as a standalone. It needs an accomplice, a companion. Its nearest rhyme, bludgeon, is a very strong word. Rarely needs any help at all. But dudgeon is a bit of a coward. It needs to get high before it's of any use. So Clara gives the doctor a little bit of Amscray, I'm Lord Tay, Amscray, and she's gone, right? Out of the picture. Maybe not. Her boyfriend Danny calms her down, tells her, don't break up when you're mad. Calm down and then tell the doctor goodbye. So that's where we left her in the previous episode. So is Clara gone or not gone? Now, between the episodes, the BBC did something really sly. They posted a trailer that included no shots of Clara, and then they released production stills that also included no shots of Clara. What? Is she taking the week off? Or is it really over between her and the Doctor? 
So in episode eight, when the TARDIS doors open at the beginning and out steps Clara on the arm of the Doctor, I was a little shocked. Pleased, but shocked. Clara seems to be treating this one as one last enjoyable excursion, but she's smiling a sad smile which confuses the Doctor. It's like you're malfunctioning, he says. Seems the alien Doctor is still having trouble reading human emotions, which I find odd because he's been traveling with us for 50 years, which is longer than most of you have been among the humans. The Doctor, it seems, has an agenda, one that he's not shared with his companion. Mm, couples keeping secrets. Ah, 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 ah. The doctor's been invited to this train before. There's an artificial intelligence called Gus who's running it, and Gus needs help solving the mystery of the murderous mummy. Gus wants the doctor's help, but the doctor hasn't let Clara in on any of that, and she will not be happy when she finds out. Let's leave that for a bit and deal with the mummy thing, the thing known as the foretold. Here's where I gotta really get spoilery. The foretold turns out to be very elusive because he's an invisible, other dimension-y kind of dude, except in that 66-second interval when he's about to kill someone. But as I said, even then, the only person who can see him is the person about to die. Now this leaves the Doctor with really no choice but to sacrifice the passengers, one after another, and watch them and interview them as the foretold approaches to kill them. Tell me what's happening. Tell me what's happening. Very cold. <laughs> very clinical. But great television. Now you can argue they're going to die anyway, so it's not the doctor's doing, but it's still cold, clinical. The doctor sees a pattern. He determines the foretold is likely to next attack a woman called Maisie, played by an actor called Daisy, who's off in the luggage car with Clara. The doctor needs Clara to shepherd Maisie into the dining car so he can observe how she dies. No point in letting her die alone in the luggage car unobserved. That wouldn't be useful. It'd be a waste. So he phones Clara. The TARDIS obviously carries its own cell tower. And he puts Clara on the spot. What does she tell Maisie? Doctor says, lie. Promise Maisie that I can save her. Rewind. Did you happen to catch the dialogue just as the Doctor and Clara first step out of the TARDIS? The TARDIS has materialized in the baggage car, rather a grungy looking place. And she looks around admiringly and says with no hint of sarcasm, wonderful. Doctor points out it's the baggage car, but thanks for lying. Thanks for lying? The first dialogue. Thanks for lying. Jamie Matheson is good. He is setting it up right at the outset. Thanks for lying. The doctor is drawing Clara into his work and his values and the ethical trade-offs he must make. Fast forward to the end of the show. The threat of the week is handled. The mummy's gone. We're back on the TARDIS. And it's time for Clara to go through with her plan and bid farewell to the doctor. But will she? In short succession, she lies to the doctor and says it was Danny who put her up to leaving. Then on the phone, she lies to Danny and says she's told the doctor she is leaving. Then she lies to the doctor again and says, Danny says she can stay. Mark my word, no good will come of this. Danny's bound to find out sooner or later, and then what? Until next time, I'm Mikola. <music> DVD Extras. I have become, and I hope you are as well, a big, big fan of Jamie Matheson. He's a strong writer. Hope he's back in the next series. The cool thing is he has a blog where he talks insidery stuff about writing and production on Mummy and the Orient Express as well as next week's even better episode, Flatline. Matheson talks about the puzzles he had to solve and the discoveries he made in writing these scripts. I'll leave a link in the description with a strong recommendation. Go read it. Read his blog, especially if you're interested in teleplay writing and story construction. One more thing. If I could hold you for just another 66 seconds, I've decided to kill the main point I made in this review. Yes, I'm going to dissent from my own opinion. Go. The running time of this standard episode of Doctor Who is 45 minutes. Not very long at all to introduce a complex new threat or monster, let the viewer comprehend it, gives it a chance to watch it cause a modicum of mayhem, set the Doctor on it to do his detection and deduction and negotiation, and then proceed to neutralize the threat. <laughs> when five or ten of those 45 minutes are carved out for a little soap opera on the latest on the Doctor, companion, boyfriend, triangle, things get rushed. Our ability to actually follow a complex plot is shortchanged. Plot points, which have probably been carefully worked out, are compressed as expository dialogue is tossed overboard. Explanations are hurried, transitions smashed together. As a result, it takes me two or three viewings and it's consulting some reliable online recaps to be sure I actually can follow what happened. Even then, I don't really get it all until I get some of you to explain it to me in the comments. Pity the casual viewer who comes in at mid-season. Why is Clara so bored or is she angry? What's her problem? Are they going to have to carve out another 20 seconds or so at the start of the show to give us the previously? So we can catch up on why Clara has mixed feelings about the doctor and the doll. What, what is it that the doctor thinks about the boyfriend? And how the boyfriend is coping with it? Ah. Worst of all, there's no time left for any running. 
Sorry to keep you waiting for this review. You won't have to wait so long for the next one. There's a playlist of all my previous reviews of Series 8 of Doctor Who and some others, if you missed any. And those are my movies about movies. There's going to be a new one of those this week, I promise. Bye now.